This is our second session now on Ephesians 2, 14 to 18. For he himself, Jesus Christ, is our peace, who has made both one, and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall, the hostility, abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, that he might create in himself, very important, in fact, let's use a different color, in himself, one new person in place of the two, making peace and might reconcile us both to God in one body, that together, us both in one body, both one, one new person made of two, through the cross, having killed the hostility by it. And he came and he preached good news, peace to you who were far off, peace to those who were near. For through him, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. And I said last time that we wanted to ask now how he did that, how he created oneness, oneness. 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 How he did that. But it just occurred to me as I was working on it that we really haven't nailed down and focused on the nature of the oneness yet and the peculiar language of one new person. So that's what we're going to focus on before we move on to how he did it. So, Father, show us what Paul is trying to stress for us Jew and Gentile in the imagery of oneness that he has in this passage, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So this is the one that strikes me as most unusual. He is going to create, he has created in himself one new person called a body. He has a body. And it's also not only in himself, in Christ, but in one spirit. Now, here's the way I want to draw this. So I'll create a box here. So I didn't want to make the box quite that big. And I'm going to put in here, in Christ. And in the spirit. So if you were to ask me now, how does he create one new person? Out of all these Gentiles and Jews, and he calls them one new person, how does he do it? The answer is, it's in himself. So there's Christ, and it's in one spirit, and there's the spirit. So union with Christ, uniting with Christ by faith, being incorporated into Christ, God viewing us as related to and connected with and vitally united to his son, Jesus Christ. That's what that box stands for. This is the in Christ. And the effect of that union is one new person. So he's choosing to identify all Christian Jews and all Christian Gentiles as one new person. Verse 15. And we might wonder, why did he choose to call the corporate group of millions of people, or at that time thousands of people, a person? And surely the answer is, or part of the answer is, to emphasize unity. There's just one person. God is looking at Jesus Christ, and in union with Jesus Christ, he sees one person. Not a bunch of Jews and not a bunch of Gentiles, but one person, namely Jesus Christ and all of us who are in Christ, united to him and united to each other. 
which then, he goes on to use another image, that person has a body. To reconcile us both to God in one body. So I'm going to draw a box and say one body. Christ and all united to him are the one new person, and that person has now a body. Now, why would he go there? Why, why would he move from, from union with Christ to a new person, to that person having a, a body, the body of Christ? And again, surely the answer is that if we are all one body, like I'm a finger and you're an elbow, or a hand, or a shoulder, there's no way we can write each other off. There's no way we can walk away from each other. There is unity implied in the body, unity implied in one person, unity implied in Christ. But now, using the imagery of body, other possible images emerge as well. For example, in Ephesians 1, 22 and 23, God put all things under Christ's feet, gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body. So Christ is the head over all things, and as the head and authority and sustainer of all things, he's been given to the church, his body. So I'm going to put, I'm going to put head up here. Christ is the head, 122. Or another place we see it is in chapter 4, verses 15 and 16. Speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him, into Christ, who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Lots to talk about there, but here the point is we are to grow up in every way into our head. So the head back here is an absolute reality. Christ is the head of the church. But there's a process going on as the church is growing and becoming more loving and becoming more uh, unified in right teaching and becoming more mature. It is, as it were, becoming more fully conformed to the head, dependent on the head, united with the head, shaped by, guided by the head. That's what head does. It guides the body. So headship is implicit in the body. And here's another implicit thing. We are members. So there's a head to the body, and the body has members, hands and feet and arms and legs. We see that in chapter 3, verse 6. This mystery is that Gentiles are fellow heirs. Gentiles are fellow heirs, namely with the Jewish people, members of the same body and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. So the point is, Gentiles and Jews are now in one body and are thought of as individually members of it. Or what about this in chapter 5? No one ever hated his own flesh but nourishes and cherishes it just as Christ does the church because we are members of his body. So, members here, 3.6 and 5.30, stresses that when the imagery moves from Christ to person to body, Different dimensions of the unity are being drawn out. A single person here, a single body here, but the body has a common head for guidance and for conformity to its thoughts, its ideas, 
and the body has not lost the reality of individuals. We are members of the body. It's not as though when there's one person created from all Jews and Gentiles that there are no more individuals in view. That's not at all what Paul thinks. There are members of the body. And you might say, what what in the world is the reason for stressing such unity between Jew and Gentile? And I think it would be helpful just to glance at a couple of texts as we close. Here's Acts chapter 10. Peter said to them when he was preaching to Cornelius, the Gentiles, Peter, a Jew, you yourselves know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate with anyone of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any person common or unclean. So you see what they were up against. Paul had, I mean, Peter, apart from the transforming work of the gospel, bought into the view that Jews simply are not to associate with. This is the dividing wall of hostility. Or here, here we see it playing out in conflict in Jerusalem, Acts chapter 11. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcision party, so that's the very strict separatist group that says you don't hang out with uncircumcised Gentiles, they said, they criticized Peter saying, you went in to uncircumcised men and ate with them. So there's the issue behind this stress on God has made both one. God has in Christ made one new person. God has made both one body. God has in one spirit given both access to the Father. So now we can ask, how did he overcome all this hostility so that there could be peace vertically between Jew and Gentile on the one hand and God on the other and horizontally between all these warring factions between Jew and Gentile. And I say warring factions because implicit, I hope you are picking this up, implicit in uniting these hostile groups of Jew and Gentile, all ethnic hostilities, barriers, racism, all of it must come down in Christ. We'll see more of that as we go.